I invite you to stand. Since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable works. Today we gather together to herald with the whole church the beginning of the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery, that is to say, His Passion and Resurrection. For it was to accomplish this mystery that He entered His own city of Jerusalem. Therefore, with all faith and devotion, let us commemorate the into the city for our salvation. We may also have a share in his resurrection and in his life. Let us pray. Increase the faith of those who place their hope in you, O God, and graciously hear the prayers of those who call on you, that today, that we who today hold high these branches to hail Christ in his triumph, may bear fruit for you by good works accomplished in him, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. When Jesus and his disciples drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany in the Mount, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately on entering it you will find a colt tethered on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone should say to you, Why are you doing this? Reply, The master has need of it, and will send it back here at once. So they went off and found a colt tethered at a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They answered them, just as Jesus had told them to, and they permitted them to do it. So they brought the colt to Jesus, and put their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. These, those preceding, preceding him, as well as those following, kept crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is to come. Hosanna in the highest. The Gospel of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, like the crowds who acclaimed Jesus in Jerusalem, let us go forth in peace. Six days before the Passover, when the Lord came to the city of Jerusalem, the children ran to meet him. In their hands they carried palm branches, and with a loud voice they cried out, Hosanna in the highest, blessed are you who have come in your abundant mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And As we begin to celebrate these sacred mysteries, we first call to mind our sins, and we ask the Lord for his grace and his mercy. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who as an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Savior to take flesh and submit to the cross. Graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient suffering, and so merit a share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we hear from God's word. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary a word that will rouse them. Morning after morning, he opens my ear that I may hear, and I have not rebelled, have not turned back. I give my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pluck my beard. My face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have, set, I have set my face like flint, knowing that I should not be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsorial psalm. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? All who see me scoff at me. They mock me with parted lips. They wag their heads. He relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, if he loves him. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Indeed, many dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in upon me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? 
They divide my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far from me. O my help, hasten to aid me. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, give glory to him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? A reading from the letter St. Paul to St. Paul to the Philippians. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God, something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name, which is above every name, that is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were to take place in two days' time. So the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to arrest him, be treachery, and put him to death, they said. Not during the festival, for fear that there may be a riot among the people. When he was in Bethany, reclining at table in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of perfumed oil, costly, genuine spikenard. She spoke the bell. She broke the alabaster jar and poured it on his head. There were some who were indignant. Why has there been this waste of perfumed oil? It could have been sold for more than 300 days' wages and the money given to the poor. They were infuriated with her. Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anticipated anointing my body for burial. Amen. I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests to hand him over to them. When they heard him, they were pleased and promised to pay him the money. Then he looked for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, When they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples then went off, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they reclined at table and were eating, Jesus said, Amen. I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one by one, Surely it is not I, He said to them, One of the twelve, the one who dips with me into the dish, for the Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them and they all drank from it, he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen. 
I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will have your faith shaken, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be dispersed. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all should have their faith shaken, mine will not be. Then Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he vehemently replied, Even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all spoke similarly. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be troubled and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch. He advanced a little and fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Take this cup away from me, but not what I will, but what you will. When he returned, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing again, he prayed, saying the same thing. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open and did not know what to answer him. He returned a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping? And taking your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up. Let us go. See, my betrayer is at hand. Then, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who had come from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. His betrayer had arranged a signal with them, saying, The man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him and lead him away securely. He came immediately, went over to him and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. At this they laid hands on him and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew his sword, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. Jesus said to them in reply, Have you come out as against a robber, with swords and clubs to seize me? Day after day I was with you teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me but that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Now a young man followed him wearing nothing but a linen cloth about his body. They seized him, but he left the cloth behind and ran off naked. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Peter followed him at a distance into the high priest's courtyard and was seated with the guards, warming himself at the fire. The chief priests and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they found none. Many gave false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Some took the stand and testified falsely against him, alleging, We have heard him say, I will destroy the temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another not made with hands. Even so, their testimony did not agree. The high priest rose before the assembly and questioned Jesus, saying, Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But he was silent and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, and he said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Then Jesus answered, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At that, the high priest tore his garments and said, What further need have we of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as deserving to die. Some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him and struck him and said to him, Prophesy. And the guards greeted him with blows. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the high priests made came along. Seeing Peter warming himself, she looked intently at him and said, You too were with the Nazarene, Jesus. 
But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. So he went out into the outer court. Then the cock crowed. The maid saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. Once again, he denied it. A little later, the bystanders said to Peter once more, Surely you are one of them, for you too are Galilean. He began to curse and to swear. I do not know this man about whom you are talking. And immediately a cock crowed a second time. Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. He broke down and wept. As soon as morning came, the chief priests with the elders and scribes, that is, the whole Sanhedrin held a council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? He said to him in reply, You say so. The chief priests accused him of many things. Again, Pilate questioned him. Have you no answer? See how many things they accuse you of. Jesus gave him no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, he used to release them, one prisoner whom they requested. A man called Barabbas was then in prison al along with the rebels who had committed murder in a rebellion. The crowd came forward and began to ask, ask him to do for them as he was accustomed. Pilate answered, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate again said to them in reply, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted again, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and after he had had Jesus scourged, handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the praetorium, and assembled the whole cohort. They clothed him in purple, and weaving a crown of thorns, placed it on him. They began to salute him with, Hail, King of the Jews! And kept striking his head with a reed and spitting upon him. They knelt before him in homage. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. They pressed into service a passerby, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. They brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They gave him wine drugged with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. With him, they crucified two revolutionaries, one on his right and one on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads, saying, Aha, you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself by coming down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes mocked him among themselves and said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also kept abusing him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, Look, he is calling Elijah. One of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last.
The veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of younger of the younger James and of Joseph and Salome. These women had followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. There were also many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea was a distinguished, a distinguished member of the council who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, came and courageously went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Having brought a linen cloth, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that, he had, that, he, that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, watched where he was laid. can have a seat. Um, one of the things that's just so striking of the passion is, is this whole story that culminates in the death of Jesus. I've been thinking about death a lot. Um, this whole story that culminates in the death of Jesus that I think a lot of times we don't necessarily think about death or don't necessarily aren't really confronted with death unless we're not really exposed to death unless we're confronted. Like maybe I'll say like that. We, aren't, we don't really think about death until we're exposed to it and we don't usually uh, seek out being exposed to it. it. Usually we're confronted with it. And so I think so often because like in our culture at least, we're so removed from death that we often don't think about it. Um, and maybe what I mean by that is then it takes us by surprise. It, like I don't know if you've ever had that experience where uh, death or the reality of death has taken you by surprise or taken us by surprise, which is so strange because it, it really shouldn't. Um, I, I was talking with a student recently uh, who's making a, in, a, in a class called De uh, Death and Dying and is on grief. And she had some questions about uh, dying and religion. And she had some really, really good questions that she came up with. And one of the questions she asked, she asked, um, if I've ever seen people who are terminal uh, come to faith? Uh, people with a, a terminal illness, right? People who are terminal, meaning they're on the, they're dying. And I said, I have, but then at the same time, and not trying to be funny, I said, but everyone I work with is terminal. Like everyone I see, everyone I've ever met is terminal. And again, I'm not trying to make a joke about this, but um, what we're doing right now, all of us here, all of us who are through the internet and, and you're praying with this mass right now, like we're all terminal. Um, Every one of our lives will end in death. And again, it's not meant to be a joke. Um, I guess I will say that, you know, human mortality, uh, roughly, uh, the human mortality rate continues to hover roughly around 100% uh, percentage. Like, that's a joke, but like, I mean it. We're all dying. We're all going to be dead at some point. And I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is that we pretend that we're not. I'll say that again, that we're all going to, we're all dying. And we're all going to be dead at some point, and that's not necessarily the problem. The problem is we pretend like that's not true. But when tragedy happens, when, when death comes close, I think it cuts through the illusion. I think it cuts through the, through the illusion that this life will just go on forever. I think it cuts through the illusion that my choices don't matter. Because if we're going to talk about death today, during, when we're reading The Passion of the Christ, we're also going to be talking about choices because um, everything in the, in the readings today are all about choices. And not just choices, but choices that matter. I mean, I'm thinking of like the crowds, especially on Palm Sunday, the crowds, you know, the very first gospel we have before Mass even starts or as Mass starts is you have all these crowds on Palm Sunday and they're crying out Hosanna to the King of David, the Son of David, Hosanna in the highest. They're, they're praising Jesus and claiming him as the coming Messiah. And only days later, you know this, only days later, they're saying crucify him. They're making choices, one choice on Sunday, making an entirely different choice on Friday. Even Pilate, um, Pilate who knows Jesus is innocent. You know, take all the Gospels together and you, it becomes very clear that Pilate understands Jesus is not a guilty man. And yet, to satisfy the crowds and yet to appease Caesar and to keep everyone happy, he makes a choice. 
And I think even the most obvious choice, right? The most obvious choice, we didn't get it fleshed out as much in the Gospel of Mark as it is in other Gospels, but um, Pilate was accustomed to release whichever prisoner people wanted them, him to release to them. And who'd they say? He's like, you have a choice. You can have Jesus, you have Barabbas, who do you want? And they chose. And this is the reality again. They, they chose. And now I think this is something so powerful. Um, when we keep away from death, we keep up with the illusion that I don't have to choose, that I can actually make it through life and, and not make choices or not really make the big choice. And that's a comfortable deception, I think. I think it's a really comfortable deception. Uh, the student, she also had a really, another profound question. And she asked, uh, she asked me, do you think that religion offers comfort to those who are dying? Which I, I think, again, it's a really, as I said, really good question. Do I think religion offers comfort to those who are dying? And um, the answer is, is yes and no. Because uh, there are some religions that that's, that's what they offer. They offer comfort. Um, not Christianity. Christianity doesn't offer comfort to those who are dying. In fact, um, C.S. Lewis, he wrote about this. He said, uh, he said which, of, which of the religions of the world gives to its followers the greatest happiness? And the same kind of thing is, is as far as comfort. Okay, question, which of the world's of religions of the world give to its followers the greatest happiness? And C.S. Lewis says, while at last the religion of worshiping oneself is the best. He goes on to say, he says, I have an elderly acquaintance about 80 years old who has lived the life of unbroken selfishness and admiration from the earliest years and is more or less, I regret to say, one of the happiest men I know. And from the moral point of view, it's very difficult. <laughs> I'm not approaching the question from that angle. He says, as you perhaps know, I, C.S. Lewis, haven't always been a Christian. And I didn't go to religion to make me happy because I always knew a bottle of port would do that just fine. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity, which is obvious, right, to us. I mean, especially any of us who know the ultimate story. If any of us who have been to a Palm Sunday Mass or a Good Friday service, we realize the heart of the proclamation of Christianity is that there is a God and it's the cross. It's that God out of love for us became man and God out of love for us suffered and God out of love for us took up his cross and God out of love for us died for us. And if we want to belong to him, then out of love for him, we pick up our cross. And out of love for him, we deny ourselves. And out of love for him, we follow him even to the point of death out of love for him. It's not, it's not comfortable. The last thing that Christianity offers is comfort. The last thing you came to Mass for is comfort or even, even a word of comfort. You, again, C.S. Lewis, last quote today at least. Um, C.S. Lewis says, In religion as in war and everything else, comfort is the one thing you cannot get by looking for it. He says, if you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. But if you look for comfort, you will not get either comfort or truth. You'll only get soft soap and wishful thinking to begin with, and in the end, despair. So do I think that some people think that religion offers them comfort when they're dying? Possibly, but that's not what Catholicism offers. What the Catholic Church offers, what Christianity offers are two things, the truth and a choice. There's also grace that helps us make the choice, but ultimately what it comes down to, the two things the church offers, the two things that Christ offers are the truth and a choice. Because, I mean, ultimately, that's the only reason to believe anything. It's the only reason to believe all this stuff that we're going to be celebrating, commemorating this whole week, uh, from the passion to the resurrection. The only reason to believe in it is because it's true. And again, let's stop in this right now. I don't believe in something. We shouldn't ever believe in something because it makes us happy. We shouldn't ever believe in something because it makes us even behave well. We should never believe in something because it makes us feel better. That is the, that's a foolish reason to believe anything. The only reason we believe anything is we beca- because we believe that it's true. And what we believe is true is this unbelievably incredible true story about a God who loves you so much that he became one of us and he suffered out of love for you and he died out of love for you so that you could live forever for him. And if that's true, then we have a choice. And the choice is, the one who lived and died for you, are you willing to live for him? The one who gave everything for you and for me, are we willing to give everything for him? This is, this is the question. This is the, this is the only choice that really ultimately matters in eternity. That if this is the truth, then this is the choice. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about choices recently because of this and also because I got a letter recently from someone who's going through the Old Testament with us in the Bible in a year and, and they were very frustrated with the reality that God seems to have consequences to his choices, that God seems to make it very, very clear that if you follow him and obey him, then there's blessings. But if you 
uh, don't follow him and disobey him, then there's punishments, then there's, there's a consequence. And I just, and they were very frustrated by this. They were very frustrated by the reality that there are consequences to our choices, that if I choose to say yes to God, then I get God. And if I choose to say no to God, then I, I don't get God. And I wonder if this is one of the reasons. I, don't, I think sometimes we don't like consequences, and I think that's one of the reasons why we don't like making choices. I avoid choices because I don't like consequences. And it makes sense because there are some consequences that are arbitrary, right? There are some consequences that, you know, maybe growing up, your parents had this, you know, it was completely arbitrary rule that if you do X, then you can't do Y, and then your little brother does X, then they still get to do Y. And you're like, what the heck is going on here? That's an arbitrary rule. But there's other rules that are not arbitrary. The other rules that are intensely connected. There are, are certain things that... The reason we get this consequence is because that's what I was actually choosing when I chose this thing. In fact, there are, are in, as I said, intrinsic consequences. There's a psychologist who's out of Canada, and he, at one point he, he made this statement. He said, um, he said I've, you know, he's given a talk. He said, in all my years as a clinical psychologist, he said, and this is something that really does terrify me. He said, I've never seen anyone get away with anything ever at all, even once. And he said, I've never seen anyone get away with anything ever at all, not even once. And he said, you might disagree. Maybe you think that people get away with things all the time. He says, but I tell you, I've never seen it. In his clinical, in his clinical practice, I've never seen anyone choose something and then never suffer the consequences, never experience the consequences. He says, what I see instead is this thing that happens. He says, someone twists the fabric of reality and they do it successfully because it doesn't snap back at them in the moment. And then two years later, something unravels. Two years later, they get walloped and they think, oh my gosh, this is so unfair. How did this happen? Why did this happen? And he said, he said, we're meeting in my, in my clinical practice and we're tracking it. And he says, it's like, okay, what happened before that? Well, this thing. Okay, what happened before that? This thing happened before that. And he says, we track it all the way back. And he says, we realize, oh, this is where things went wrong because you can't twist the fabric of reality and not have it snap back at you. If I choose something, I'm going to get the consequence. In fact, that's one of the gifts of consequences. Consequences reveal to us what we're actually choosing. I'm going to say that again. Consequences reveal to us what we're actually choosing. So I lie to get out of something. What I'm actually choosing is to not be a trustworthy human being. That's what I'm choosing. If I lie to get out of something, what I'm choosing is I'm choosing for you to not be able to trust me. If I gossip, what I'm actually choosing is I'm choosing to break relationships. I'm choosing to poison relationships. It's not what I really want, but that's what I actually am choosing. Again, consequences reveal what, my, what I'm actually choosing. If I choose to do something I know is wrong, I am, what I'm actually choosing is I'm choosing to make myself divided. I'm choosing to make myself weaker because consequences reveal what we're actually choosing. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons why we put off choosing. Again, um, I mean, you say, I'll just, I'll just avoid choosing altogether. Remember, the thing the church offers, the thing that today offers in this Mass, this Sunday morning, is two things, the truth and a choice. You say, if I'm on, I'll avoid choosing. Well, you know what? The truth is, not to choose is to choose. To not decide is to decide. It's to decide to become a Pontius Pilate. I'm faced with truth, but I don't want to choose it. It's to choose to be part of the crowds who one day say, oh, we're all saying Hosanna, okay, and the next day saying, oh, we're all, I guess we're all saying crucify him. And just going with the crowds. Not to decide is to decide. Not to choose is to choose a certain kind of consequence. And one of the consequences I think is just powerful. I was reading recently uh, Dante, in Dante's Inferno. We're going to talk about this today and on Holy Thursday. Just there's this recognition in Dante's Inferno, right? He wrote, writes this back hundreds of years ago. He has this vision or the poem is of a vision, right? Essentially. And Dante's being guided by Virgil, the ancient Greek poet. He's guided by Virgil on Holy Thursday, through Good Friday, Easter, uh, Good Holy Saturday into Easter Sunday, through hell, through purgatory, and ultimately to heaven. And as Dante is being guided, they cross into hell, and there's those famous words over hell, and it says, abandon hope, all ye who enter here. And the first place, then this is the outskirts of hell, right? But it, it, it's, what, it's called the vestibule of the futile. And what Dante describes as seeing in the vestibule of the futile is what he would call the uncommitted. As he looked at, he said, he looked at this and he said, um, I had not thought that death had unmade so many human beings. I had not thought that death had unmade so many people because he saw so many people. And what were they doing? He said, they were all chasing after this blank flag that constantly eluded them. Why? Because they had spent their entire lives 
not ever standing for anything. They spent their entire lives not actually choosing good or evil. They'd spent their lives indifferent and impartial. They'd spent their lives like the crowd. One way I'll choose, choose this, the next day I'll choose that. Like Pilate, I know it's true, but I'm not really going to do what I know is right. And he describes them like this. It's just, he says, that actually Virgil is guiding him through this. And Virgil says, let us not speak of them. They don't even deserve recognition. These kind of people who never stood for anything, they don't even deserve recognition. He says, let us not speak of them. Just look at them and pass them by. Because that's what you get. That's what we get when we don't choose. Again, the church offers what? On Palm Sunday, it offers the truth and a choice. And Virgil describes these folks, and Dante describes them as he says, those who live without disgrace and they live without honor. They weren't horrible and they weren't good. They lived without disgrace and they lived without honor. It is as if they were never alive. It is as if they never were alive. The mark they made on the world wasn't evil and it wasn't good because they never chose. In fact, he even goes on to say um, that these are the angels who were fallen angels who were never rebellious toward God but had also were never yet true to God. And they were blinded. And there's this classic line, he says, the fame of them the world has none and nor does it suffer. We don't remember them for their goodness and we don't even suffer for them because mercy and justice both have scorned them. Why? Because they lived only for themselves. Remember what C.S. Lewis said about one of the happiest men he ever met? Unfortunately, was a man who just simply, he belonged to the religion of self. And in doing so, chose something. To make a decision is to decide. To not choose is actually to choose. And this is the outskirts of hell. Because the church and Jesus offers two things the truth, and a choice. And so the reality, here's the last thing, the reality is we have to choose. We get to choose. And here's the good news is we get what we choose. And that's what I would say back to the student who said, does, does religion offer comfort? And in some ways would say, you know, like, like C.S. Lewis, it doesn't begin by offering comfort. By, it begins by offering the cross. It begins by offering the truth and a choice. But it ends with what? It ends with knowing that we get what we choose. That if we want God, he wants us. And if I don't want God, then I get not God. If you want God, you know that he already wants you. Because there's one last character in the gospel. And he's the main character. He's the reason why we exist. Jesus has made his choice. Like, again, you might be in a place where here's the truth and here's the choice. You haven't made it yet, but Jesus has made his choice. And he chose the cross. And he chose you. And he did this so that you and I might have the courage to not simply chase after a blank flag for eternity, to not simply live a life that's truly not alive, to not get to the end of our lives realizing not only do I not have comfort in death, I did not have meaning in life. But he did all this. He chose us. He chose you. So that you and I might have the courage to choose him back. I invite you to stand. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit, was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident in our Father's love for us that he has chosen us, we now reach out to him with our prayers. that all Christians may embrace the joy of this Holy Week with a commitment to repent of past sins and strive for holiness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That church leaders may proclaim with courage and conviction the gospel of Christ crucified. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That world leaders may reflect the sovereignty of Christ as they work to eliminate unnecessary suffering from their countries. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the crucifixion of Christ for all people may teach us that there is no such thing as a worthless life for a person God does not love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those preparing to enter the church this Easter may be protected from evil and grow in holiness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that those who have died may find everlasting joy in the Father's kingdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the grace this week to remember the truth of the gospel, the responsibility of our choice, and the unstoppable power of Christ's love, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We continue to offer our dasses in prayer for vocations. Almighty Father, we beg you for an increase in religious vocations and holy marriages in our diocese. Help us to be generous in our response to your call. Choose from our homes those who are needed for your work and strengthen us with the courage to say yes and to follow you. Help us as a diocese, as a parish, as families, to encourage and foster vocations to the priesthood, permanent diaconate, and consecrated life. We commend our prayers to our patroness, Mary, Queen of the Rosary, and ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine, a work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Through the passion of your only begotten Son, O Lord, may our reconciliation with you be near at hand, so that though we do not merit it by our own deeds, yet by this sacrifice, made once for all, we may feel already the effects of your mercy, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For though innocent, he suffered willingly for sinners and accepted unjust condemnation to save the guilty. His death has washed away our sins and his resurrection has purchased our justification. And so with all the angels, we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Sabao, Pleni Sun Celia Terra, Gloria Tua, Hosanna in excelsis, Benedictus, qui venit in nomine Domini, Hosanna 
in excelsis. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all your saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of your family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Anius Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, 
Miserere nobis, anius dei, qui tollis peccata mundi. Miserere nobis, anius dei, qui tollis peccata mundi. Dona nobis pace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. An act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Father, if this chalice cannot pass by without my drinking it, your will be done. Matthew 26, verse 42. Let us pray. Nourished with these sacred gifts, we humbly beseech you, O Lord, that just as through the death of your Son you have brought us hope for what we believe, so by his resurrection you may lead us to where you call, through Christ our Lord. As I mentioned, uh, I think last weekend, uh, we will have, we also have Palm Sunday Mass today, and we also have on Thursday, we'll have our Holy Thursday Mass, well, Good Friday service, as well as Easter Sunday, not Easter Vigil, but Easter Sunday, because no one needs um, the singing of me. So we are going to have our Easter morning Mass, not our Easter Vigil Mass, just FYI, so you can plan out your, your schedule. If you have a chance to get to the Easter Vigil actual Mass, it'd be absolutely phenomenal, as well as just the encouragement. We've, we've been encouraging our students for the last number of weeks, to, uh, to seek out confession as we get closer and closer to the end of Lent and the, and the beginning of the Easter season, the celebration of Christ's resurrection. Um, and so this week, there's confessions all over the place. Hopefully where you are, you have the opportunity to go to confession. If you don't, maybe you have your priest's phone number and you can <laughs> call him or text him or some kind of way of getting a hold of confession this week would be phenomenal. What a great gift to be able to say, Lord, I am actually choosing you. I'm choosing to give you my whole heart. And if you are able to do that, phenomenal. And if you can't, uh, try again next week. That's all I have to say. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your I invite you to bow down for the blessing. 
Look, we pray, O Lord, on this, your family, for whom you, our Lord Jesus Christ, did not hesitate to be delivered into the hands of the wicked and submit to the agony of the cross, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, Et Spes Nostra Salve. A te clamamus, exules filii eve, a te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in ac lacrimarum vale. Eia ergo, advocata nostra, ilos tuos, misericordes oculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesu, Benedictum fructum ventri tui, nobis, post hoc exilium, ostende. O clemens, o pia, o dulcis, Virgo Maria.